Michael Elgin Missing, Family VE Friends Asking for Help The family and friends of Michael Elgin, Aaron Frobel, are asking for help in locating him. He has been missing since yesterday afternoon. His friend Maria James posted to Facebook to say they are very worried about his well-being. Elgin is believed to have sent a concerning message to his sponsor Eric before going missing. Elgin's sponsor Eric also took to Facebook to ask for help in locating him. He posted the following to Elgin's personal Facebook page. Hello, my name is Eric and RMA, friend slash sponsor of Aaron's. L don't want to cause too much alarm or worry anyone too greatly, but I've been helping Aaron through a lot of things lately, and yesterday he left a concerning message on Facebook and at his home. Myself and my wife have a spare key to check in on him, and when going to see what was going on we found his phone, but he was not at his home. We have his phone, but his vehicle was not at the home so we hope he just went somewhere to clear his head. If anyone on here hears from him or sees him please reach out. I can be reached at 314-6129455. We're hoping for the best in this situation. Michael Elgin's career has been plagued by allegations that he staunchly denied, but it still crippled his pro wrestling career. He is a very talented performer, but controversy followed him. Now his friends are worried. The 34-year-old is father to a son who will turn six years old in September. Please contact the number listed above if you have any information. Uh, it's good to uh, be able to speak no matter what the conditions are of being able to, but there's quite a few things I need to say. And first, I want to start about wrestling. You know, I'm about to turn 34 and I started wrestling at 14. And wrestling really uh, changed my life. You know, growing up, I was very obese, but I knew to be a wrestler, the wrestlers I had watched were in phenomenal shape. So I found a gym and I got in shape and I joined a wrestling school. And ever since then, it's defined me. Actually, before that, it defined me. You know, I was the wrestling kid. Uh, wearing the wrestling t-shirts and playing with the wrestling toys and watching wrestling my entire life and It was an escape for me, you know as an obese kid you get picked on a little bit and My escape was to come home and watch wrestling or play with my wrestling action figures and at school I wore a wrestling t-shirt and I, I felt like I was invincible because I had the ultimate warrior or Hulk Hogan or even Hacksaw Jim Duggan or the British Bulldogs on my t-shirt and it was like a badge of honor for me to wear those shirts. And when I started in wrestling, you know, I kind of just forgot about everything else. Not only forgot about everything else, but I really didn't give much time to anything but wrestling, you know. Um, it just eclipses every action, every thought, every movement. You know, I worked out to become a wrestler. I watched wrestling to get ideas for wrestling. And then I would take long train rides to train and back on the train and go to school and finish school and go back to wrestling. And it just was, it was everything to me. And I devoted sometimes too much of myself to it. Now I don't regret that. And I'm not blaming wrestling for anything because I made a choice to put wrestling ahead of everything else in my life. And unfortunately, there's consequences when you put wrestling or anything that's an object or profession above everything else that matters. You know, I uh, lost my grandmother and she was in my house my entire life until I'd moved. And I wasn't home for a funeral because one, I didn't live in Canada anymore because I made the move to the States to be with somebody who was very important to me. And uh, because of wrestling, I didn't go to her funeral. Now again, that was my decision, I'm not blaming wrestling. My uncle who spent a lot of his life in and out of our house and was a father figure to me passed away as well. And again, I had missed his funeral because of wrestling. But I think even more so, I missed four out of five of my son's birthdays. I missed anniversaries. I missed my spouse's birthday. I missed holidays. I canceled plans because 
wrestling took precedent and it was the one thing that defined me, you know. Uh, many people I meet in life outside of wrestling, uh, they didn't refer to me by Mike or by Aaron. They said, oh, the wrestling guy or the wrestler. Because it was the one thing in my life that I gave everything to. I gave my body, I gave my heart, my soul, my work, my dedication. You know, it was the one thing that I wanted to do and do as good as I could more than anything. You know, I didn't care what other label I had on me. All I cared was that main label and the main definition of me as a person was wrestler, was pro wrestler. And uh, I shouldn't have let it. I should have devoted my time equally between wrestling and my family, and I didn't. And after being falsely accused and having to go through the courts, and luckily the person who accused me had done enough damage to other people that they came forward to, and it came out that those were false. Uh, instead of devoting my time to my family, I devoted more time to wrestling. I got in the best shape of my life. I was spending five, six hours a day in the gym, and I was watching wrestling come up with new ideas, ideas saying, you know, these people who once supported me, who would turn in a fraction and not listen to me and not hear me out, I'm gonna prove them wrong and I'm gonna be better than ever. And unfortunately that war on my marriage and as supportive as she was through that time, uh, I distanced myself and the communication started to get worse because it was already bad. As I said, I, I would go to Japan and then after Japan, I would come home on a Tuesday night and Wednesday I'd wake up and I'd go to the gym and I'd teach my wrestling class and then Thursday I'd be on the road again. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'd get home Sunday and Tuesday, I'd have to leave again for a different country and I wasn't giving the time, the support or the communication that was needed. And I started to realize that my marriage was failing and I realized that I'd given too much to wrestling. And in 2018, as was reported uh, by Dave Meltzer, I'd signed a two year deal with New Japan. But in 2019, I asked for my release because I wanted to not be separated and I wanted to have more time with my son. But the communication had fallen so great that there was nothing to really fix. I got a little bit more time with my son, but because I knew I had done such a poor job of communicating and I'd done a put, such a poor job in putting my spouse and my family on the same level as wrestling, that it couldn't be worked out. So I did date other people and there was times where I thought I could work it out and it was just not the time for either. And we both realized that there was not a marriage to work out, that we were friends raising a child. So in November of 2019, we decided that we did need a divorce. And then we started earlier this year on going through the steps to be divorced. And we are currently divorced. Now, I have nothing poor to say about her because my son has autism and he needed a lot of attention. And I was so busy trying to make sure that they were financially stable that I didn't get to give that attention, but you know, she did. And just the way that he lights up any room he's in and now being home and, and being able to spend more time with him, she's a godsend and a miracle because everything he knows and everything he learned was from her. And I couldn't have been blessed with a better person to spend eight years of my life with. And I couldn't be blessed more to have her be the mother of my child. And I thank her for that. And I thank her for all the time we spent together. And I thank her that we're friends now and can co-parent our son. So now that that's finally spoken out loud because it was decided not to vocalize that to the public because unfortunately we are, and we put too much out there that's happening in our lives and that allows people to reach out. And, and that wasn't something we needed because we didn't need to deal with that. We needed to deal with our son and I needed to deal with 
being there more often for him. So that was a decision not to speak out about that. And unfortunately, people say certain things and we felt it was time to to say that publicly now. But more importantly, I should see, I'm doing it again, not more importantly, because they are still the most important thing in this universe, because their happiness is important and their livelihoods is important. But other things I need to discuss, firstly is the Kevin Steen show. I know that I did an interview in 2013. Remember, 2013 and 2014, I was Ring of Honor World Champion. 2015, I went to New Japan. Countless main events, uh, countless championships, it did not affect my career negatively. Now, the story that I told on the Kevin Steen show was lewd, was inappropriate, was immature, and also false. Now, there is sections of this story that I over-exaggerated from the actual happenings. And I've expressed the actual happenings multiple times, but now, for the first time, I'm gonna express it in the video, and also with some proof. Um, on the way to Timmins, myself and multiple other wrestlers, this was 2007, we're just talking, and it was said, I don't believe that there's actually females out there that enjoy or are aroused by being urinated on. And in fact, if you ever found a woman that enjoyed that and was aroused by being urinated on, I would give you a hundred bucks because I wouldn't believe it. Now again, not a bet, just something that was said off the cuff. Um, we went and performed in Timmins and after the show, we went out to a bar that sponsored the show. Uh, myself, two other wrestlers, met three females. They were accompanied by a couple. Now the gentleman of the couple bought us a bunch of rounds, had us sign a bunch of merchandise, uh, had to sign his wife's shirts, and yes, he did have a sign his wife's breasts. Now, about an hour or so before the bar closed, he was kicked out of the bar for being in a fight with somebody else at the bar. And then when the bar closed, myself, the two other wrestlers, and the three females wanted to go back to the hotel. The gentleman's wife, who was still there at the bar, asked her friends to leave with her. They said no, sent her home in a taxi. Me, the three girls, went back to the hotel. The two other wrestlers left the bar with somebody to go get a case of beer from his house because we did not purchase any alcohol prior to going to the show and prior to going to the bar and we wanted to have a few more drinks at the hotel. When they got back to the hotel, a few other wrestlers did come into the room. We all did have a couple drinks. When the other wrestlers left, it left myself, the two wrestlers and the three females in the room. Things occurred. After that, a wrestler and one of the females hopped in the shower, was not me. And then coming out of the shower, he yells, hey, I just peed on her and she liked it. Where's my hundred dollars? And she yelled, you only peed on my leg and it was in the shower. Not a big deal. The next day, we did joke to the person that he was owed $100 because he found a girl who liked being urinated on. So that is the true story and that is exactly what happened. And again, I have two signed affidavits by the people who are also part of this story to verify these are the happenings in 2007 in Timmins, Ontario. Now, there was also an accusation made earlier this summer by a young lady and... It was in multiple tweets, and one of the tweets just stated he, referring to me, uh, Michael Elgin, tried to sexually assault me. Now, the night she was speaking of, it was in 2010. It was in Louisville, Kentucky. She states that I must have, I, sorry, I thought she was sleeping. So let's unpack that first. Thinking is something only one person can do. You cannot speak to their frame of mind or what their thoughts are, and that's in a court of law. I did not think she was sleeping though. What actually happened is myself and the wrestlers, who also stayed in the hotel room that weekend, went out to drink. After the bar, we went to the strip club. The strip clubs in Louisville closed at four. We proceeded back to the hotel early morning after the strip club. As we got in, she awoken on the bed. I got in bed because it was my evening to share with her and asked her to have sex. She said no and I went to sleep. She states that I was in the bed with her because I had a crush on her and one of my boys thought he'd do me a favor. That is not what happened. She came with us, paid for the hotel, and the deal was she slept in the hotel bed every night and each night one wrestler would share the bed with her and then the other nights they would be on the floor so that every wrestler 
got the bed one evening and she got the bed every night because she had paid for the hotel. That's why I was sharing the bed with her. She did not refute that. She did not say that there was a certain person not allowed to stay in the bed. It was confirmed prior that one wrestler each would share the bed with her, which she was okay with. So proceeding with the accusations, she states, I tried to put my hand down her pants. As I went to go down further, so if I was to go down further her pants means I was not touching her private areas. Again, I did not touch her, not over the clothes, not under the clothes. She then states, she moved so slightly to show that she was awake and wanted no part of that, in which I stopped. So, in her version of the story, I attempted to have sex with her. She made it clear that she did not want to, and I stopped. So, her original claim was that I attempted to sexually assault her. Now, I understand what an attempt of a sexual assault could be. Now, it could be that I made sexual advances, she gave no consent, and I continued to do so. That would be sexual assault. It could be sexual assault if I was trying to forcibly put myself on someone and somebody else had to intervene and remove me from the situation, which there was other wrestlers in the hotel room, but clearly in her statement that she states she remembers like it was yesterday. Why would she lie about it? did not intervene because I did not try to force myself on somebody. I also understand that if I tried to force myself on somebody and they did not want me to, if they had to fight me off, that would be something. But she clearly states here that she made it apparent she did not want anything to happen and I stopped. Now again, I got into bed, asked her to have sex. She said no and I went to sleep. I have signed affidavits here of people verifying this story because they were also present in this hotel room that weekend and that evening. Now, I understand that me asking to have sex could be inappropriate, but it's not illegal, it's not attempted sexual assault, and it's not sexual assault. She said no, I did not try to push the issue. I've also spoken to a private investigator as well as some people who are police. All three of them have confirmed that with this statement on Twitter, it is a non-prosecutable offense. And if she had tried to make a police report of sexual assault or attempted sexual assault, after it was found to not be so, I would be able to forward criminal charges with making a false police report. But due to not making any formal complaints or police reports, my only course of action is to try and deal with the person making the claims or try to remedy it by a defamation lawsuit. I have reached out on Twitter through an advisor stating that there's 45 days to try and correct this situation or I will proceed with the lawsuit. I had also emailed a criminal attorney in Michigan, who happens to be my accuser's father, gave him the info and said, I would like to deal with this civilly. If not, I would have to proceed with a defamation lawsuit. Now I did that because I would like to not drag anybody through that time and that effort and that money. I would also like to not go through those issues because it is very expensive. Not only is it expensive, it's time consuming and it wears on both people's mental health. And unfortunately, both sides will be attacked, and that is not something that needs to be done. So I hope that this can be remedied prior to having to take that route. But if not, I am going to have to further my communications with the attorney I have been in contact with. Now, as far as a dick picture that was sent in 2016, now, yes, any kind of picture you send is inappropriate and should not be done. Now, when it was said online that I had sent a dick picture unsolicited, I had reached out to the person to say I was 100% sure I never sent the picture. The only thing I remember was hanging out with her and two other 
uh, female wrestlers in Japan. We went out to dinner, had a couple drinks, and I thought it was a nice evening. She said, you're right. We did hang out, and everything was fine. You didn't do anything. But then you were out with your friends drunk. You told me you got caught talking to a girl while you were out with them, and they said, oh, that means you have to send a dick picture, and then you send a dick picture. And I said, wow, if that happened, I am sorry. She replied with, to be fair, you said sorry after you sent the picture. It's not like I'm accusing you of trying to rape me. So she's trying to say that it's not a big deal, that I had already apologized. But still yet, this is where we're at. So I understand it was inappropriate whether it was my picture or not because she had shared the message with a friend of mine and also showed me it and it was a Google image picture that I sent. Now that is stupid and immature, but clearly uh, I didn't want to send a picture of my junk and I didn't. It does not make it right. Me being drunk does not make it an excuse. But in a situation like this, if you send a picture unsolicited and they don't want it and you continue to do so or continue to harass somebody, yes, it is very much a problem. If you don't realize that your actions were wrong and don't apologize, I understand that's a problem. And usually in today's world, what happens is something like this comes to light and people will say, well, you're not sorry it happened, you're sorry that you got caught. But I apologized four years ago in 2016 before it ever came to light earlier this year. And I truly am sorry about that. And I apologized because it was inappropriate. It was inappropriate to her. And when I was with my wife, that was inappropriate to her as well. And I apologized to them. And I'm apologizing once again to the people that saw that statement without hearing anything else. Again, not an excuse, not even close to an excuse because it was inappropriate, but it is a little different than trying to harass somebody. And I apologize regardless of the circumstances around the picture, but still the circumstances are much different than would be led to believe when it is involved in a very just movement that is moving forward against people who are inappropriate. So to anybody who reached out, fans, friends, wrestlers, uh, I appreciate you very much. We all share a love, and that love is wrestling. And I look forward to, to getting back to it, and I look forward to just life. So thank you for watching, and have a wonderful day.